just want to testify, make it crystal clear. Take See, time. I've been picked out to be picked on. Oh, no. Shocked about out my friend's mouth. I've been beat down yeah. till he turned my life around. Turn my life around. Seems like I always fall short of being worthy. I ain't good enough, but he still loves me. Yeah. I ain't no superstar. The spotlight ain't shining on me. No, 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 no. Cause I went to bed on top of the world Today the world's on top of me Now everybody's got opinions They share They ain't been in my position They That it breaks my heart when I hear what they have to say about me What they yeah. say about you I always fall oh, short sure. Praise on up in this peace right here. Y'all yeah, know how we do. You sure? Come on, let's go. Yeah. Get your hands up.
Um, both of those songs, by the way, are from the movie The Fighting Temptations. Um, the Fighting Temptations, it's called. Um, it's about a uh, church group in, I think, southern USA who, uh, enter a de who enter a song competition, basically. It's quite an amusing movie. It's um, not deeply emotional, but uh, it has some very good songs in it um, about God and connecting God's love and so forth. The, the second one you heard is called Rain Down, and uh, it's about God's love raining down on you based on your desire. So, The beauty, the beauty of uh, songs and music and dance and all of those things are that it connects you a lot to God if you allow it to. And, uh, and that's why before the group, before the break, remember you asked Peter about the emotions that occur in a Pentecostal church, for example. And you can see what it does. It just buoys you up and you have all this joy and then if you really have a longing for God in that process, then God's love, of course, can flow into you in that process and you feel quite, quite strong. That, that was um, leading on to my question. And, and, <laughs> and uh, I, I, my observations when I was reading the Paget messages was that uh, Paget had a background um, that was fairly intellectual and so he wasn't a, a, a deeply... It, it, I didn't get the impression he was deeply emotional um, all the time. But I just wondered, like, and it, it seemed obvious that he did receive a lot of divine love because he kept getting told that he was getting filled up with it over and over again. Does, the question is, does divine love always feel um, approximately the same when someone receives it or can it come in different forms and, and can you actually receive it without even realising it? Or? Um, well, let's answer the last question first. Um, yes, you can receive it without realising it. But most of the time it's a very emotional process that you're just unaware of. Um, so, so you're unaware of why you're crying, you're just crying and sobbing and you can't really understand inside of yourself why intellectually. But once you start realising what it's about in a conscious manner then you can obviously replicate that process. The, the issue that most, that most Pentecostal movements have is that, is that they have a trouble replicating the process beyond a certain point because you, as you have longings for God's love to enter you, obviously your love enters you, but eventually your love enters you until the point where you're pretty much full of the love itself and, and there's only times of faith that it, you raise above that condition for a little bit more to enter you, but the rest of the time you're trying to suppress your emotions, so trying to suppress your false beliefs and false desires and all of these other things that affect you spiritually and as a result of that, um, you often are in a state where, um, where you're no longer receiving divine love. So what a lot of people experience when on the divine love path is they, they come against the pageant messages or they come against the divine truth. They feel this passionate longing for God open up in them because they have this desire for truth in them. They open that up, they receive divine love over a period of days up until the point when they've sort of topped up as much as they can be without releasing some emotional beliefs or... Some, uh, some belief systems, emotions or, or uh, you know, desires that are disharmonious with love. And so it, it hits the wall of our personal will, our resistance. So what happens is we receive the love, receive the love, and then it hits the wall of our resistance. And once it hits the wall of our resistance, it's very difficult after that point to receive more. And so most people, um, even in the uh, Pentecostal movements, for example, most people, they receive the love and then they think they received the love because of their beliefs. Mm. But they actually received the love because of their beliefs. They received the love in spite of their beliefs <laughs> and because of their passionate desire for it in that moment. And, uh, and because they don't understand that, they receive the love to a certain point and then they call themselves, you'll hear the term often, they call themselves saved. Born again. Right? Mm -hmm. Born again. And what they do is they equate the process of receiving divine love to the point where they're topped up as being born again. So they feel they've gone through this process of being born again. The reality is that for the majority of them, they've only had one topping of divine love until they've hit resistance. And then because they are un unwilling and they don't know how to release their resistance to the rest of the love flowing, and they're not yet born again, they've just received some divine love. But they sort of remember it as an experience. 
they remember it as a complete sort of experience that they always refer back to and it in many times keeps them bound to the religion that they experience that experience in. What happens when they walk out the front and the, the preacher goes up and says, you know, by the love of God or whatever, I forget the words, he goes bang and hits you on the head and you just go down like a ton of bricks. <laughs> Well, that is a not so pleasant thing going on, and it's actually to do with spirit possession. The problem with um, many Pentecostal movements is that basically you're opening yourself up to what they would term the spirit. Now, what they don't understand and what's, what's sort of misquoted in the Bible is that many of these so-called spiritual gifts are not so much gifts, but rather they are spirits connecting with you in times of heightened emotions within yourself and heightened spiritual reflection inside of yourself and many people in that state are highly mediumistic so you have a spirit in that state take you over and I've been along to some of these places where you actually can see the spirit interfering with them sometimes the spirits making them flop around on the floor even is that what speaking in tongues is and often the speak yeah, mo almost all speaking in tongues is actually about an overcloaking of a spirit starting to babble in a different language. And unfortunately, many times it's actually a spirit in quite poor condition. Um, what, what's the motivation of the spirit to want to do that? Well, the motivation of the spirit is to get some connection to the earth and have some power over people. The motivation of the person is to get the approval of their audience and feel like they're full of the spirit, when in reality they're full of a spirit, but it's just not the spirit <laughs> they're hoping it is, right? So they're actually not full of the Holy Spirit or God's spirit, See, and there's, and there's also a misconception of God's spirit itself. They view God's spirit as an entity or a thing that possesses them, when in reality God's spirit is the conduit via which the divine love can enter you and possess you. So, so the, the reality is a, a lot of these false beliefs then manipulate the, what, what happens in the, in the service. And as a result of that, um, many people misconceive what's going on and they allow things that are actually sometimes quite damaging to their own soul and to, the so and to themselves. Mm. And it's all due to the false belief system that man has created that we can't sort out the difference between what's, what was happening in a pure way and what was happening in an impure way. And many times if you started babbling in a different language, for example, right, and then could translate that language on top of that into... Now, a lot of people might go to you to do that, right? But can you see how your own addiction to power or glory or all these other kinds of things can hook into that? And before you know it, you've got an audience who are listening to you. And imagine there was a congregation who knew you quite well. They'd always be looking at you to have this, this, this emanation of the spirit come out of you. And all of a sudden you change and you become a different person. Say all these words and everything. One goes, wow, isn't she amazing? She must be really connected to the spirit. You know? And in reality, all that's happening is she's a medium who happens to be in that moment connecting to a spirit of various conditions. Mm. And this is the damaging thing uh, about a lot, of, a lot of what goes on, is that because no one really understands the full truth of what's going on in the, in the service itself, there's a lot of acceptance of what's going on without actually looking at what's behind. When you can see the spirits who are present, then you can see actually there are bright spirits present many times, but there are also quite dark spirits many times present as well. And it just depends on the person's individual soul condition as to which one of those spirits connects to them individually and also what that spirit then does while they take possession of the person. And in reality, what a lot of these religions condemn, which is spirit possession, which they condemn quite strongly, they are actually sh demonstrating in their own services. Mm. So, so that's uh, the sad part of it, but there are a lot of very positive parts of it, obviously. One of them is that songs like that, um, that we've just been listening to, particularly the second song, which basically all the way through it has no untruth in it um, and talks about God's love raining down on you. Um, that Songs like that have also been created by that, by, by that movement, which is fantastic because mm. that, that's a very powerful way to connect to God's love. When I was speaking to one of my friends who'd been in it for like 30 years, he kept saying to me, oh, God, God talks to me and God tells, told me this and God told me that. And, and I mean, if God's a soul, he doesn't have a voice. So does God talk to you? And if he does, how does he do it? Only through feelings? Got it. 
Um, you are correct in your assumption that God is a soul. We are in our pristine state soul. Any words we are hearing are coming from another source other than God. Now, it doesn't mean that the ultimate source somewhere back in the chain wasn't God. Do you understand? So sometimes what happens is that a, a God, through this communication of the soul that occurs, through the connection we have with his love, communicates to the soul of a celestial spirit. The celestial spirit then turns those things into words and communicates with a six-sphere spirit. And the six-sphere spirit then usually adds a bit of their own embellishment into that and communicates to maybe a third-sphere spirit. And then a third-sphere spirit adds a bit of their own embellishment into that, depending on which path they're on as well, divine love or natural love path. And then he talks into our ear. And we think, we think that it's the voice of God, when in reality it's the voice of a spirit with some modifications that may be coming from God depending on what the message is, unfortunately. But um, for many of us, we believe it's God because there's had many motivations in our life to listen to them and we've followed those motivations and found that, yeah, what they were saying was true and so we then think it was God. But it can easily just be a spirit of its own right raising some issues with you and telling you what to do. This is where your feelings are very important in your connection with God because it's actually the soul-to-soul -soul connection that we're talking about with God that we want to, that, that is built by faith but also by the longing for love that we want to, to, to grow, not so much the connection with, with spirits. When I say not so much, obviously all of us would like to be connected, yes? Like you want to be connected with everyone with love, wouldn't you? Like that, that's a strong desire in us, so there's no harm in that desire. But obviously, while, different, while, while we're at all in different conditions, and this applies even after we've released all of our errors, we're still all in different conditions. Some of us might be in the eighth sphere, some of us in the tenth, some of us in the third, some, all of us in different conditions, all in different states of love and different states of understanding. And we can all connect on the basis and through this unifying factor of God's love. But it, at the end of the day, our, if our focus is connecting with spirits rather than connecting with God, then we are basically, we're, we're losing what can be the biggest source of all truth to us. In the end of the day, many of us prefer to connect to spirits rather than God. First, because we hear the voice in our talking to us in, uh, in return. I've never heard it. And so some, but, but you actually do have many spirits communicating with you quite often and frequently. Peter. It's more with a feeling. I, I and they're pushing you feeling. along through your emotions as well. Some of them in, an, in a damaging way and some of them in a very positive way. And this is why sometimes you make damaging choices and sometimes you make positive ones. It just depends on what emotions are there. But, but you've learnt to trust your own emotions and they know they can influence your emotions a certain way, so they do. Some of them positively and some of them negative. And that's the way most of us get communicated with. But others who are a bit more mediumistic and don't have the blockages towards seeing or hearing spirits actually hear the words in their, in their spiritual ears, if you like. They hear the words entering them. They know that it's somebody outside of themselves or they have somebody take over their handwriting or whatever else. But just because the person claims to be God, it doesn't mean that they are. So and, when, uh, when we're, if we can connect to God and, and receive divine truth, does it come through as a knowing or a feeling or an inspiration or um, an um, awareness or how does it? How does it show up for you? <laughs> You've seen me when I'm communicating with you. Like, it's like a packet of information comes to me and it's just a blah, blah, and I just say it all out. Does that make sense? Like there's no thought in the process. It's just packets of information, pictures. Like a, like a flow. And it's like a flow, constant flow. Now, as you connect to God more and more and more, that flow will increase in its intensity until when you become at one with God. And from that moment on, you still have all of your own creations. But any time you remain in inspiration and start talking about God's truth, all of a sudden you can actually feel the flow of God's love flowing through you and then out. And, you, and a lot of times you're not even really conscious. You, you know what you're saying, and you, and, but it's very rapid. And, and it's very hard, in fact, for me at times to slow myself down enough for, for you to grasp what I'm trying to say um, because, it, because there's just so much information coming. And when you get at one with God, it's like whole packets, whole packets of information come to you and then it's a matter of you spending, like a whole packet can come to you in a second or so 
and you might spend an hour speaking that packet to a group of people on earth. Because mm. right? it, it, it happened in a second, in an instant, coming to you, but there's so much involved with it that it just flows out of you, flows out until you're done, sort of thing. Can you ask God to help you with your sense of humour? Um, quite often I've thought I've lost my sense of humour. <laughs> but that's because of the emotions that are, that are uh, there present anyway. A lot of times our sense of humour is based around our emotional injuries and what we want other people to perceive. And so we just need to allow ourselves to work, like all of these things, work through the desires and emotions that we have that are blocking us up and everything will flow very fr freely. You, you will not be your true self until you're at one with God. And even then, you won't be your true, true self in terms of amalgamated soul until you're at one with your soul mate at one with God. Right? And so because of that, there's a lot of progression to make. But, but it's a, it can, once you hit the state of at one with God, from then on all the pain you experience in the process of growth no longer exists. So after that point is a very joyous point, obviously. And... And that's where, where most people struggle. They struggle in the, st in the step from getting. Usually most of us begin like I began in the hills in this, in this life. So most of us begin in the hills in this life because of the damage that's been done to our, by our parents and our environment to us. We begin in the hills and we slowly progress, 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 progress as we release emotions, ask for divine love, soul expands and so forth and we progress until we make that transition into at one moment with God. Now when you make that transition, that's the time when you become the inspired one in, in the sense of at the moment many times people on earth are actually being inspired by spirits who are in a higher state than themselves. But when you become at one with God, you have this direct connection with God through inspiration, which means that it, it, you can transmit packets of information to large numbers of people through the same methods that God transmits to you. And you, you can also do things that you couldn't do before. And that's, that, that's the only way that I began healing in the first century. So people say, oh, but you were a healer then or you did this then or that then. No, everything that I did then was dependent upon this connection with God. So it was really God choosing to do it through me because I had longed for God to get to myself to get into the condition where God to, could do that through me. And in the uh, Life of Elysium, there's a little portion that um, it quite, quite affects me because it actually describes the exact process I went through in the first century. And that is, I had, I'd read, was reading from the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah in the Bible, there's a, there's a section that talks about um, becoming willing to have God send you to others, like being willing to be a messenger. And there's a portion that goes, God was asking the world, um, who is there ready that I can send? And, uh, and when I, um, when I feel, felt about that, you know, I wa I, like I wanted it to be me. And, and you at some point have that same feeling. That I feel that sometimes. I just don't feel I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and then as that feeling enters you, that pulls your soul towards God. And as it pulls your soul towards God, God's love and God's love enters you more, you get to the condition where God can send you and for there not to be any damage through your message that you're teaching. And unfortunately on the earth today, many of people are thinking they're connecting to God, but they're actually connecting to a spirit who's not anywhere near even the, con the condition of connecting to God. And as a result of that, a lot of the untruth that's coming through them um, just continues to damage the world and create more mud on the world, you know, it creates more murkiness here rather than actually freeing up the truth. So my, my suggestion to you is just develop this really passionate, strong longing inside of your soul to have God connect with you and, and be in this place with God that you can choose to be. And God wants this connection with all of you. Not, not just with one person. So let yourself connect with God in this manner and all of you then will become God's messengers in all different ways as a result of that connection. So my, that's, that's when, when you're in that place, what does it feel like? Well, all I can describe at the moment are my memories of that place and, oh. and my, because I, I'm not yet back into that condition. 
And so my memories of that place are often like full of grief for me because I'm still, at, what I'm processing through at the moment is all the grief about the loss of that place. Does that make sense? Mm. So, but my memories of that place are, if you can imagine yourself that no matter what anyone else around you is doing, thinking or saying, you know everything they're doing, thinking and saying and every emotional reason why they're doing it in any interaction, but you don't feel any damaged damage from it. So, so in an audience like this when you're at one with God, if you were standing up the front of an audience like yourselves at one with God, you can feel every single feeling the audience, every single member of the audience has about you. You can also feel every single feeling the audience has or thought the audience has about you. While you're, so while you're talking in front of the audience, you're actually processing all of this information. All this information is coming at you. Right? I've noticed that you can do that already to quite a big extent. Yes, but, but still not in the sense where it doesn't affect me. Because at the moment I can still... So whenever you as an audience or some of you as an audience project condescension at me, I feel that. And I have to allow that emotion to pass through me. And it has an emotional response in me of grief. And sometimes I've got to go away and process that. And whenever I, uh, people pro, um, feel towards me... Um, there's lots of different emotions I feel in any one audience. That are, do, you, do you feel our love when we send that to you? Sure I do, of course. That's good. But, but can I just bear in, mind, bear in mind with love that when your soul is full of grief about things, it's very, very hard for you to feel loved. Does that make sense to everyone? Because what happens is, and what happens is it's like love is the water off the duck's back and all of the other emotions are the ones that hit you and hurt. Does that make sense? Mm. But as you, as you get closer and closer to alignment with God, the love is the emotion that you absorb and the other emotions are the ones that are automatically off the duck's back. You know what I mean? That, so in other words, you, you don't absorb them anymore. They pass through you still. It's not like you're rejecting them. Um, it passes through you. You still don't have judgment about them or anything like that, but they pass through you. But, but the love-based emotion remains with you. And so if you can imagine that state all the time, so it's 24 by 7 in that state, then that, that's partly what it's like to be at one with God. And then have, even more importantly than that, just imagine yourself being in this state with, with God, where you know you are permanently connected to God. Every single moment that you're awake and asleep, you can feel God's love flowing through you. Can you imagine what that's like? It's like you know you're loved at every single moment, no matter what is happening around you. It doesn't matter what is happening around you. You're loved every single moment. Not, not that you imagine you're loved. Mm. You actually feel that love passing through you from God every single moment. So you can walk around without any fear at all. Remember when we had the fear processing stuff that we were talking about? I said, can you try to imagine what your life is like without fear? Just being this, that one aspect of being at one with God is just an amazing thing to think about, to have your life without any fear at all. That means no fear of saying exactly what you know to be true because you know, firstly, that everything you say is going to be loving. Secondly, no fear that of any single person under any circumstances in any situation. They can be yelling at you, screaming at you, holding a knife at your throat, putting a gun at your head, and you still have no fear. If you can imagine being in that place, not because you've intellectually manufactured it, but because you feel it all the time. Right? So these are all parts of being at one with God. God doesn't feel fear. God constantly has this love flowing. God, you're in constant state of bliss no matter what occurs. You feel the barrage of emotions coming from the world, but you're not in the world. And that's why I said the words in the first century that a lot of people have misused, that you're in the world but not of the world. Mm. Because you, you've got this barrage of, of emotions coming to you from the world that normally would affect you immensely, that you'd either be trying to avoid, trying to run away with, or going for, or depends whether your addiction's in play or whatever. But none of those things are in play. You're not of the world in the sense that you, none of these things actually impact on your life ever, no matter what happens. And when you're walking around in that space, every single person around you feels that and knows that from you. Right? Whether some get angry because of it, others are sad because of it, 
Others are happy because of it, but they all know. And every spirit you meet is either jealous of you or happy for you. <laughs> right? Jealous in the sense that they're not in the same place or happy for you because they you know, are in the same place and can feel that. So it's just... The, the, it, and this is a part of growing your faith. A part of growing your faith is doing exactly what every single person in history who have ever extended the light, who have ever extended humanity in some way, had to do. And what they had to do at some point is imagine. Just imagine whatever it is. They had to imagine what a plane looked like. They had to imagine what landing on the moon might be like. They had to imagine, nobody had ever done it before. So they had to imagine it. And they had to imagine it and they used their imagination to grow their faith. Remember, faith is based on truth and, and actual events, actual evidence. So they got all this actual evidence that they could get. They grasped all that. But in the end, they had to put it all together as an, and imagine what that must be like. And in a way, that's what we need to do. If you, if you're going to continue on the divine love path, there will be so much obstacle at some point in your life, so many problems, so many issues with it, that in the end it's going to be just your passion for God that gets you through it all. Just your passion for God, that's all. Nothing else is going to get you through it all. You, you, can, you can have a love of a partner, but what if that partner hates your guts part the way through this process? That's not going to get you through dealing with your stuff, is it? And what if, you know, you've got all these friends, but what if all your friends desert you through the process? Then where are you going to be if you don't actually have this passion for God? At the, in the end, the only thing that is going to get you through this process is your passion for God. Now, your passion for truth is a part of that, is a part of your passion for God, but it's not going to get you through the process. Many of us have had a passion for truth in our lives but has it actually changed our life? Well, a lot of times we don't even know what's true and what's not true within ourselves half the time because of our emotional state. So even the passion for truth isn't always going to get us there. But our passion for God, our desire for God, is what in the end is going to lead us home. And in the first century, I just learnt to have the passion for God. And that passion in this century has been with me all my life. It's, it's an intrinsic part of what it feels like to be an int intrinsic part of me. So is a passion for God and faith different or are they connected? Certainly. Well, they're connected because faith, faith gives you evidence that God is a certain type of person. That God, when I say person, I lose that term usually. But that God is a certain type of being, that God is a loving God, that like God is a caring God and all those things. Faith is what keeps you that in mind. If I'm not connecting to God, I keep reminding myself the same thing over and over again, all the way through my own progression. If I'm not one with God right now, it's because I have an emotional injury of some kind inside of me that prevents my condition of at one with God. I need to be humble enough to see that. I need to desire even to see that. No one else is, needs or has to show me that. If I desire it inside of myself, if I long for knowing what's going on inside of me that's preventing my relationship with God, because I passionately desire God in my heart, then I am going to be drawn into humility automatically. I am not going to be arrogant and shut, shut it all down. I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to say to people all the time, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know. I'm going to listen to everything and let myself feel everything and I'm going to work my way with everything, work everything through inside of myself that le to lead me to God if I have a passion for God. If I don't have a passion for God, then I'm not going to do that. At some point in my life, I am not going to, I'm going to stop. I am going to stop progression. Because at some point in your life, an emotion is going to come up that interferes with why you had your passion, other than this passion for God. For example, if I've got a passion because, uh, you hear this a lot, I want to be free of my emotional injuries, people say to me. Well, I say, well, that, that's lovely that you want to be free of your emotional injuries, but in the end, if you don't have a passion for God, you're never going to get there. Because how are you going to deal with your emotional injuries when they're so, some of them are so terrible that you're going to feel like stopping? What, what's the other motivator? What, what's going to motivate you when the emotional injury feels like you want to stop? What's going to mo motivate you then? Well, most people at that point, just get, who have 
a passion to do it only because of how it changes themselves, they stop because there's nothing else motivating them. You know, some people say they have a passion to do it for their children. Well, that's a great thing to do something for somebody else. But at the end of the day, sooner or later, this motivation you have for your child is going to be challenged in some way. And before you know it, you'll have an emotion that you don't want to deal with that emotion for your child or anyone else. And what's going to get you through that? It's only going to be a passion for God. And what happens when you say, oh, I'm doing it for my relationship? Well, what happens if the relationship breaks? Who are you going to do it for then? Can you see, under all these different circumstances, if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, it's soon going to be exposed. But if you're doing it because you have a passion for God, now you're going to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and you're going to be humble and you're going to let yourself see things. And when people tell you things, you're not going to go, oh, no, no, I don't agree with that or oh, no, no, I don't agree with that or that's just your opinion or any... You won't do any of those kind of things. What you will do is you'll let everything settle inside of you emotionally and you allow yourself to feel everything, not for them and not to be agreeable or anything else, but because you have a passion for God and you, and you see every situation as your law of attraction. You see every single thing coming up as, wow, this is, an, this is an opportunity for me to learn how to get closer to God. And you look at every one of God's laws, you know, the law of attraction, for example, and instead of hating it like many of you still do, you love it because it's your way to God. You know, so everything that's attracted to you, you don't blame it on a past life or a this or a that or, or some kind of... You know, uh, uh, you know, some kind of emotional problem in the other person who's yelling and screaming at you at the time, you look at your own emotional addiction and you look at that sincerely because you have a passion for God. If you don't have a passion for God, you'll want to tell the other person off and you'll want to criticise them and you'll want to put them down and all those kind of things. But when you've got a passion for God, you don't desire to do those things. You want to focus on truth, what's right and your passion for God. Have you always had that passion? Because I'd like to grow my passion more, but I'm not sure exactly what to do to grow it. Um, your passion for God, Peter, is something you have to grow. Every single person, including myself, has had to grow. Okay. There, there was, in the first century, I can remember the passion beginning, but, I, but, but in the sense that, you know, when I started picking up little beetles when I was little and I could start feeling everything about it and start connecting to the creation. See, what I've been doing today with you is trying to help you connect to God, God is good, for example. Right? So I've had, to, I've had to actually work my way through this emotionally 2,000 years ago, whether God is good or not. The world around me was saying God isn't. The world around me was saying that God's a punishing God, that you have to sacrifice your animals to appease the wrathful God. And this is the world I grew up in, that I lived in at the time. There was like the religious leaders oppressing the people. They were taking all the money off the people. You had the Romans taking all the taxes and the religious leaders taking their own tax off the people. And before you know it, everyone's upset and angry with God. And that's the environment I grew up in, everyone angry with God. And I had to somehow work my way through that to the point where I said, to myself that I want to know this real God, not this God that everyone thinks is God, but the real God. And the issue you face personally is that you are still yet to fully realise that passion. That you can, and you can see that inside of yourself at times where, where you're willing to avoid your emotions or you're willing to avoid the truth with yourself or others or whatever in order... But all you're doing in the end is avoiding your connection with God. And, and what we need to come to terms with is we're only hurting ourselves firstly whenever we do that. So it might feel good to be able to say, oh, no, no, I think that's her problem and not mine. That feels good. But uh, what's going to feel better is you at one with God. Uh, so which good do you want? Do you want to feel good temporarily in a situation where you've had a bit of a barney with someone or fight with someone or a bit of an up, one upmanship with somebody or something like that or do you want to feel good permanently not because you need to do that anymore but because you, but because you're at one with God and at the end it's only this passion for God that you do need to grow yourself no one else is responsible for it no one else can do it for you no one else can even make you do it no one else can even encourage you to do it you look at how much encouragement some of us get to do it and yet we still resist so it has to come from within ourselves. 
And, and that's the desire that we need to grow inside of ourselves. Do I want to know my mother? Do I want to know my father? My, I mean my real one, not the one here on earth who's my brother or sister. I mean my real mother and father. Do I want to know them so well that I live with them constantly? Do I want to feel this state that God is in? Where God can share all of her love with me to such a point that I can become not only at one with God but also at one with my soul. My own soul and is going to become unified. Myself and Mary, together one. And we, and we walk around in this place in two bodies being one person connected to God. Is that what I want? How much do I want it? Am I willing to forsake all of my earthly possessions for it? Am I willing to say, forsake all my comfort for it? Am I willing for, to forsake all my family if, that, if they make that happen for it? In other words, if my family browbeat me and say, you're a stupid idiot trying to do this connection with God thing, I say, no, 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 sorry, I'm doing it <laughs> because this is what I want. And what about, uh, what about your friends and what about your work and what about all these things? And the irony is, if you're willing to forsake all those things for it, what you get in return is like hundreds of times more beneficial than any of those things you could ever imagine. You know, and no one on the earth, aside from myself in the first century, no one yet on the earth has ever experienced at one moment with God. And we think, all do you think to, we're going to get there? Of course. I, I don't return for no purpose. <laughs> <laughs> like, of course, that's my desire to help everyone, including myself, get there. Yes. And, and some are getting closer and closer, obviously, right? And soon, as, as these different emotions get sorted out and these different things happen, you'll see the shifts into it one that different people make. And what, when the first one does it, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to do it then, isn't it? But don't hang back waiting to deal with your emotions until then. Because then you'll be three years behind the eight ball of what you could have obtained three years earlier. Why, why be without God's love for another three years? Why would I choose to do that? I could only choose to do that because I don't love myself very much. Really, isn't it? So, so don't rely on... Uh, don't wait for AJ to become at one with God. Why wait for that? Like you, you have enough evidence inside of yourself. You have enough, if, enough external evidence to know that God is good, that she loves you and cares about you individually. Right? Many of you don't feel it, I understand that. But there's enough evidence there that that is true. So start the process. Start trusting the process. And experiment even with the process. Stop, stop, stop trying to criticise the process all the time, intellectually trying to work out whether there's any justification to it. The truth is we're not at one with God yet. So how do we know whether the process is wrong? We don't. We need to at least try the process before we'll know. And you can criticise it intellectually all you like, but at the end of the day, until you try the process, you will never know whether it works or not. And the beauty of the way God works is you try something, something works, something changes. Ah, OK, another realisation. Now, not only do I have a realisation that's occurred inside of myself, but now I also have something that's quite significant, and that is I have a foundation for further truth and further faith. You see, every single time you deal with something, one of these things that I've written about, morals, <coughs> desires, emotions, and all of those different things, every time you deal with one of those that are out of harmony with love and you release it from yourself, you will notice a law of attraction change in your life. When you notice that law of attraction in your, change in your life, that becomes proof that that process works. Now, it might have only happened once, so there's not a huge amount of proof at this point. But what you do is you remember it. You remember what you did. And then you go and do a second time and a third time. And after a while, you're doing it so rapidly that you're even doing it after you know, one or two or three times a day. And every single time, there's a law of attraction change, law of attraction change, law of attraction change. And you start noticing the law of attraction change. And you can compare today with one month ago and say, wow, in the last month, I've just like grown immensely. And my law of attraction has demonstrated to me the truth of that condition that I have grown. So I allow myself to feel that. And then I use that as my basis for further faith. 
So when I get to a really, really hard emotion that feels really terrible and I want to run away from it and I feel really bad about it and all I want to do is sit in the corner and, and scream and yell and, and crack a tantrum rather than deal with the emotion, I remind myself, hang on a sec, I've been here before and I've always gotten through it and I've always gotten out the other end and out the other end was always closer to God, closer to myself, closer to my soulmate, closer to my family and so forth. And, and so when I say closer to my family, obviously what I mean is I feel closer to them. It doesn't mean they will feel closer to me. I feel closer to them. I feel like I love them. And, and this is the beauty of you focusing on the process. So you don't even have to trust the process to actually try it out. All you need to do is sincerely do it for a period of time and use that as a test to see whether it works or not. And then talk with other people who are here who have done the same thing and see whether it's worked for them. Notice the people who are changing and go and speak with them. What happened? What changes? What re get them to remind you of a few things. Does that make sense? Let yourself build on the truth you already know. AJ, do you have that passion like all the time during the day or does it like bubble up when you're in prayer? or when you sort of um, take yourself away and be uh, um, quiet, or is it there all the time? And passion is like every other emotion, in that it ebbs and flows, obviously. So, so obviously when you get to a state where you're at one with God, you still have passion, but there are still many things that you still haven't learnt about, and you need to have a passion to learn about them before you will actually learn about them. So passion is something that is going to ebb and flow for the rest of your existence. But what will remain is your constantly growing love entering you from God and the constantly growing love that you can then reflect to the world around you. And that, that will grow and grow and grow and grow in size and in, in its maturity and the way it's demonstrated. And as that grows, obviously you do become more passionate and the cycles of passion go up but like a line like this. So you might start here and you're not very passionate and there's your passion ebbing and flowing. But then as you progress in love, it's going up like this. And it can grow infinitely, just like every other emotion you have inside So is this over a period of hours or days or weeks Peter, or months? Or Peter, stop. <laughs> <laughs> you're not feeling any answer I give you. No, I was just trying to understand whether you have that passion there all the time. No, no, no. What you're trying to do is here again. Right? You're trying to understand here and it's question after question, but w with the questions you ask, you're not feeling the answer. And so, and so you prompted to the next question without actually feeling the answer of the previous one. Already I've said 10 things to you, 10 questions you, you've as asked, 10 ask things. <laughs> Can you remember my answers to any of them? I'm going to go and write down as much I as I know, you had to write down some and you can listen to a recording, but at the moment you can't even remember the answers that I gave to any of those questions you've asked. And that will demonstrate to you that it never hit your soul. I think I can remember some. <laughs> <laughs> you have a think about it. So, so, so what I'm saying to you is let yourself settle with these questions. These questions are coming from a heart that's still feeling like I'm not there, I'm not there, I'm not there. Okay, admit you're not there. Admit that to yourself. Rather than trying to get away from that, admit that to yourself and start praying to God about that the emotion that's present. You're, you're wanting to know intellectual thing after intellectual thing after intellectual thing after intellectual thing, but avoiding the emotion that's present that drives every one of those questions. Does that okay. make sense? Thank you, AJ. And that sounds like the battery has worn itself out, <laughs> or I've worn out another pair of batteries. <laughs> Before I ask any more, I just want to emphasise to everyone that your relationship with God on this path will need to be your most precious possession. In the first century I said it needs to be higher of value than anything you can own. I called it pearl of high value that you've got hidden in your field. And who of you, if you had it, a $10 million pearl hidden. Who of you wouldn't want to uh, find the place where it's hidden and dig it up? So wouldn't you spend as much of your time as you possibly could 
spending it on that relationship. So, so don't, you don't need to trust me. You don't need to believe me even. But if you want to be close to God, you do need to believe God at some point. And you do need to connect to God. So just experiment with what I'm saying and see whether it does not enhance your relationship with God or not. Stop holding on to false beliefs or beliefs that you have that keep you locked up into the same place that you've always been. Does that make sense? Just because of pride or arrogance or just because it's comfortable or just because it's easy or just because of any other reason. Focus on your relationship with God and say, all right, I'm going to place this relationship first and whatever it takes from me, I am going to give it to, to develop it myself and have that passion inside of yourself to do that. If we can go across to Anna over there. Um, I just wanted to share something that, you know, uh, earlier in the talk, I was, I was too nervous to say it then. I, <laughs> my heart starts feeling like crazy as soon as I put my hand up. Yeah. Um, um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to share something that I feel. Like you're doing a lot of, um, you're talking a lot about how God caters abundantly for our needs. And I feel like God caters so abundantly for our desires as well. Like mm -hmm. there's mountains and there's lakes and there's beautiful animals and there's like we can crush up rocks and paint with the colours that they create. And I just think it's really gorgeous and I want to share it. Yeah, yep. <laughs> that's, and that's part of what develops our faith understanding everything that God has done for us and feeling it inside of our heart, you know. And that, that becomes the motivation to connect to the creator of these things. You see, mo most of us are, are addicted to connecting with the creation. But, but the creator, we, we sort of feel the, that she is so far away that we can't connect to her. And it's totally the opposite. The creator is standing right next to you, really. There's all this love ready to enter you. And we dismiss that in lieu of the creation. And, and so let yourself, through the creation, connect to the creator. Let yourself feel the wondrous things God has done and feel the power of that, motivating you to be closer to this person. And allow yourself to see that you're a work in progress, getting closer and closer to God. And allow yourself to be a work in progress. So, so stop trying to be rigid and say to yourself, well, no, no, I want my way to be the right way. You know, many of you have said to me, oh, I can't agree with you on this issue and I can't agree with you on that issue and I can't agree with you on this issue. Just stop for a moment. I understand you can't agree with me on lots of issues. Right? But just stop for a moment and consider, are you at one with God yet? No. Well, if that's the case, then is it possible that the reason why you're not agreeing is because there's an error? Is that possible? Like, are you progressing as much as you observe myself progressing? Because, because if, if you're not, if you're stagnant while somebody else is progressing, there may be some things that that other person knows that you don't know. Does that make sense? So notice the people in the, in the room that are processing and, and progressing and talk to them. So what have you had to do here? What have you had to do there? And ask them questions about what they've had to do. And then, and then make a sincere effort inside of yourself to do the same thing and just not talk about it, but to actually do it. Alex, thanks. Jenny, you're projecting lots of neediness at me. That's why I'm avoiding you. Um. AJ, I'm relatively new to this path. I've only been on for six months. Yep. But I can definitely say that this is the only path, and I've been on lots of different paths, this is the only path that I've noticed a real change within myself. Yep. And um, it's just been incredible. Yep. Um, I'm at a point now where I don't 
really care about anything else yeah. <laughs> other than my relationship with God and my relationship with Soulmate. Yeah. Um, my parents are really angry with me. They're very angry with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't care if I lose everything. I don't care if I live on a beach, you know, with just in my underwear for the rest of my <laughs> life. I don't. I don't care. Yeah. Like this is the only thing. It's it's all that's driving me. Yeah. And I notice a change within myself all the time. Yeah. And I have so much faith, and I'm receiving so much love. Yeah. And I just, uh, oh, I really wanted to. A couple of weeks ago, I had the desire, because see a lot of new people in the audience here, and just to say, you know, stick it out, and and just really listen to him and and experiment and try it. <laughs> Because you'll never look back, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Myself and Mary often comment, we, we were driving back from our trip away and, and Mary was sitting in the car next to me and she says, this truth thing is just amazing, isn't it? Like, <laughs> and the reason why we had that conversation was because she had some major realisations that many of you are yet to have about truth and how important it is. And, and uh, she went through this experience of realising actually that when you remain in truth 100% of the time, your life actually gets easier, not harder. And it's only your resistance to the truth and your fears about the truth that cause any truth-based interactions to be difficult. And when you get into the state where you're no longer afraid of the truth and you're no longer afraid of remaining in it, you actually invoke all of God's laws in, into harmony with your path. All, all of God's celestial spirits are now agreeing with you because you're in this state of truth. And when I say in a state of truth, not, it not, doesn't mean that everything that comes out of your mouth is truthful. What it means is you're in this state of loving the truth and being like addicted, if you like, to the truth, wanting the truth in your life day by day. And this passionate desire you have to stay in that state, what it actually does is it brings all of God's laws into harmony with you because all of God's laws are based around, the, every one of them has truth associated with them. And as all of God's laws come into harmony with you, it means that every single thing you do becomes easier, not harder. So if you're experiencing it harder, it means that there is some laws yet that you're still actually working against. Right? And all I do is I say, all right, this feels hard, this feels hard, something's wrong here. <laughs> something's wrong here inside of me. Something's wrong here inside of me. Yeah. And can we go right up the back? Yeah. I can see a hand waving in the darkness. <laughs> AJ, can you explain, um, Mary has a reference to the, um, the love that the apostles received at Pentecost. Can you explain what that actually is about? Well, it's very similar to what I described with Peter when he asked his questions earlier. What happened, what happened for a period of time after my death was that most of the so-called disciples and apostles, which I don't think of them as that and neither does Mary, we just think of them as our friends and acquaintances, <laughs> and most of them were in a state of deep grief about my passing for, for many reasons, not, be, not just because they felt a love for me um, or anything like that, but because they felt that a lot of the things that I'd taught them was that were actually false because I died and they didn't expect me to die. And so they went through huge amounts of grief and they processed huge emotions with God and huge emotions about trusting myself and then huge emotions about the truth that I taught. And as they went through all of this grief, their condition lightened. And as their condition lightened, they got closer and closer and into a place of stronger faith. And because they got into a space of stronger faith, now what could happen is the celestial spirits by this stage, who were now at one with God too, because there were many, could now influence those people in a much more positive way. And God's love could flow into them directly. And as a result of that, many of the celestial spirits could actually speak through them to the, to the rest of the people there in the language that the people were listening so there was a time when Peter got up in front of 3,000 Greeks and Peter couldn't even speak it right? at the time. He, he learnt to speak it over time, but at that moment he couldn't speak that language. And yet he spoke the language 
exactly that, that, that they needed to hear about the divine truth. So he spoke in tongues, but it was in the tongue of the people who were the audience who needed to hear the truth. And, and that was just a demonstration that they had received enough love for these major changes to take place. Now, already for many of you, changes are taking place. Some of you who have never been, had, a, had a gift of mediumship now have one. Some of you who have never felt the, a power of healing but except through others now can start feeling a connection with God through healing. Some of you are already starting to experience that. Many of you don't talk about it yet, but you're already starting to experience it. And, and as it grows, and when you get into this condition eventually of atonement, you'll be able to do these things all the time. So what happened in the first century was, yes, there was this heavy spirit influence after my passing of love, divine love spirits, the spirits on the divine love path in the celestial realms, who entered the celestial realms in the three years of my ministry, and they actually, including myself, projected all of these feelings and all of this truth to the group of people who were in the upper room at Pentecost. And because of their desire for God and their longing for God and the fact that they had just had 50 days of crying their eyes out, <laughs> they could connect with that and actually experience divine love flowing into them, for many of them the first time, and that had a fantastic exp ex ex um, effect on everyone around them. You see, what many of us don't realise is the only way that this truth will grow on this planet is for each of us to embrace it. That's the only way it grows. And because when we make the child changes inside of ourselves, now the other persons who are ready to listen to truth but need somebody to teach them have a teacher. You see, all we need to do is get the teachers ready and the world is full of people desiring truth many more than what is here in this audience. And when the teachers are ready, more people can come. And, and that's exactly what happened in the first century. And they had spent three and a half years with me listening, as some of you have now spent three years listening, have you not? Who, who's had three years or so? So there's a few in the audience who had three years listening. So they spent three, they, so they knew me for the amount of time you've known me. And they've had that amount of time listening and then and then because of my death, feel all these different emotions, then feel the truth of it. And then as the divine love comes and enters them, now they're in a state where they're ready to be given these gifts from celestial spirits to help the momentum. And, and God has historically given different gifts to the planet based on the momentum. Remember I said, and you would have heard this quote perhaps, that if, if I can't speak, the stones will speak out. So in the end, God has a plan to have the divine truth come to this planet. And it began, that plan began many, many years before I arrived in the first century. And you and I are a part of this plan. But we have to embrace it. We have to embrace it. God doesn't cause you to be a part of the plan without your will being involved. Your will must be involved. So when you exercise your will to avoid your emotions and avoid changing your, your, the belief systems you have and avoid changing your, uh, your, your acceptance of truth and, and all of those things, you are exercising your will and all it's doing is actually keeping you away from being a part of this greater plan that God has. And when you turn that around and when you say, oh no, oh, what I'm going to do instead of that is I'm going to connect to God connect to her in truth. I'm going to work through my emotions, work through my beliefs, work through my morals, work th and do all of these things, not for anyone else, not for AJ, the world, or anybody else. You do it because of you and have, you're having a desire for love and primarily your desire and passion for God inside of you. And when you do that and actually do it rather than just talk about it, what happens is everyone around you will feel it. Some will be angry, some will be upset, some will be happy, but everyone will feel it. And as they feel it, the people who want truth in their lives will be attracted to it. And that's the beauty of you exercising faith now. Because, see, the people who exercise the faith on the flimsiest of excuses are the ones that have the most longest-term benefit. If you, 
if you watched me in the first century and one day you'll be able to see pictures of all of your lives including my, and my own and all of it and so you'll be able to see what happened in the first century. If you watched a picture of me looking at a little, at a little bug on my hand and connecting that to God, right, that was pretty much the flimsy of, flimsiest of excuses for me to connect to God if you think about it right, in terms of the judgement of everyone around me. But my desire and passion started growing from those moments, just like yours can. And when in the end we get to the stage where now we've got, we're in this state where we have so much faith that we, and our faith is, is supported by the evidence, supported by the proof. And when, when we're in this state of having so much faith, we can from that moment on progress so rapidly and help so many other people progress as well just by exercising that faith. And we don't even need to be at one with God yet to prove the existence of God's love, to prove the existence that, that God actually exists, to prove the truth. We don't even need that yet because, because we're in this state where we're feeling it inside of ourselves as a truth and we're acting upon it without fear. And that's the beauty of faith. That's what faith does to you. Faith changes you so much and forces you into action. Right? And that's why the words that are written in the Bible um, are so important to remember in a way. That faith without works is dead is a dead faith. In my opinion, there's really no such thing as a dead faith. If, if faith is dead, there wasn't faith there in the first place. The truth is that faith will always motivate you to action. So if there is not any action going on in your life at the moment or you're feeling like you know, everything's quite stagnant, look at your faith. Look at how much you believe God is there waiting for you. Look how, at how much you believe God is this loving, perfect person who wishes to give you her love and look at why you're rejecting it. Just allow yourself to conceive why what's going on and understand that when we don't act, what we're doing is just proving to ourselves that our faith isn't there. That's all we're doing in the end. We have the microphone. Um, thanks, Raj. He's coming behind you. Um. <coughs> Before, when everyone was dancing, um, I had the desire to do it, but I just couldn't get myself to do it. Yep. And I just felt like running away really bad. Yep. And I did. I left and, and I got really angry. And I didn't want to come back and I was like, what? Dancing, me not dancing is going to be the thing that... <laughs> stops me from coming back again and I'm like, what? Yeah. Um, and I just want help, please. Um, well, why? Let, let, rather than me give you, tell you why, again, look at the emotions. Remember what we said, you went, I don't know if you were here yesterday, were you? Yep. Remember what I said yesterday that every time I'm angry, I'm just telling myself about an addiction that I have. So, so other people were dancing and I got angry. So that, that means that I've got some kind of expectation within me, some kind of addiction with me, within me that's getting challenged. What did you want us to do? Not dance. <laughs> Not dance. Why? Because it, I wanted to feel safe. So when people are dancing, you don't feel safe. Mm. When people are dancing, you don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. Mm. When... If you're saying that you wanted us to stop dancing so you could feel safe, then that means if people are dancing, you don't feel safe. If people are moving their bodies about, right? So obviously there's something in your past about people moving their bodies about and dancing and you being terrified because of something else going on. A potential of violence perhaps or something like that that you feel. That's it. So allow yourself to feel it. Your anger is just telling you that 
there's a fear and your anger is the control part of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, and no, all you know, yeah it does. It's so, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't even matter if it, it makes sense. <laughs> You're feeling the emotion anyway. And what the emotion is, you are terrified of people's movement in a group. By the way, um, many people are terrified of group movement. The reason why is group movement is often motivated by a lot of spirit movement as well, where people become you know, embroiled in a situation that is beyond their, seemingly beyond their control. For instance, you go along to a soccer stadium where there's violence and, uh, and you can see the group mentality it grows and grows and grows until everyone feels much the same because they're all connecting via the same emotions and that affects everyone. So uh, getting back to the subject though, can you see how important faith is to your progression? And can you see how important even focusing firstly on God herself is to your progression? Can you see that if, if you don't have a desire to connect to God, that will ex be exposed very, very rapidly in this, pl in this progression towards, towards God. You, you will find it exposed. And remember this, that every time that God hears your soul, hears mine, God wants a relationship with me. But for me to stop blocking this relationship, I have to be open, receiving. And I need to have a longing. And so in the end, it does get back to those three things, remember, the longing for love, to long for truth, and to have humility. And in the end, one of the biggest parts of the faith that you'll need to actually develop is to believe that those three things are necessary for you to be at one with God, for you to actually be in this relationship with God. So it, in the end, you'll get told a lot of things, and I have told you a lot of things now over two or three years. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of talking where I talk myself silly <laughs> with whole thing, lots and lots of principles about divine love and divine truth. The key thing comes down is how much do you want a relationship with God? Are you willing to experiment with what I've taught, told you? Or are you still going to sit on the fence and wait until the first person does it and then do it yourself? Well, you're able to do any of those things if you wish, but my suggestion to you is just do the process now. Start the process now and have faith that all of these things that you've been taught and all of the things we said in the Paget messages to James Paget all can come true for you. And don't have blind faith. Don't have it because, you know, you just sort of dream it out of thin air. But have it because there is so much evidence that God loves you and God cares for you and God wants this relationship with you. And let yourself experience it by being totally open to anything that's going to happen on that path towards God. So what I would like to encourage you to do is to pray a lot about having that kind of a faith. The kind of faith that moves mountains. Right? And sometimes the biggest mountain is our own butt, <laughs> isn't it? That we've got to get up and actually move. And, and what we need to do is have, that, have enough faith that it, that it picks us up out of our lethargy and moves us forward constantly and we're not, we're not inhibited by this person saying that thing and this person saying that thing and this person having that doubt and that person having that anger and this person having this rage and that person feeling violent towards us. We're not, we're not stopped by anything. Not because AJ says you shouldn't be stopped by anything, but because you have a passionate desire to connect to God no matter what. <coughs> and once you get into that place, you will find that your progress will be rapid. 
It's only when you get out of that place that your progress slows down and even stagnates and sometimes even goes backwards here on earth. The truth is on earth you can go backwards because you can choose to remain in rage or remain in resentment or remain in shame or remain in self-punishment or remain in punishment of others. And you can choose to do that for a long period of time and degrade your own condition that you've already tried to grow. And you can choose to do that too. That's the beauty of here. We can choose to do anything we wish. But in the end, isn't the best choice just to connect directly with God? And we need to stop the experimentation through others. Do you, do you know what I mean by that? Like, like Monica can talk to spirits, right? So what we do is we run to Monica and experiment to it with everything through Monica. Why do that? Monica's got her own emotional problems and issues, <laughs> right? Hasn't she? Like, that she will freely admit, right? So, so why do that? Why do that? Now, Monica may wish to give her gift to you at some point. That's fine. But why do that? Now, others like Alex, he's got the same kind of gift. He's now stalking and he's feeling the motivation to heal, right? Feeling the motivation to heal people. So now I'll be tempted to run off to Alex to get a healing. Right? Why? Because I'm still trying to run away from the fact, really, that at the end of the day, I can do what they're doing. And if I connect with God, I will have the same kind of gifts and I'll recognise the passions inside of me, whatever they're for. And my faith is what's going to get me there. It's a beautiful thing, folks. When I think about um, my own life, it's the faith that's got me through most things. Just the faith that God is good and the faith that I, God wants a relationship with me. And it's that, and it's that faith that just keeps me going when I'm, when I'm at my worst. And when I'm at my worst, you know, when there's hundreds of things happening, thousands of things sometimes happening, where I'm getting thousands of spirits nasty and thousands of people nasty, where I'll get people close to me that I love dearly get upset and angry with me. And it's just my faith that everything's going to come out in the end because it did in the past for me. But even in the past, I had the same kind of faith. I had to develop that kind of faith. And that's the kind of faith that just keeps you going. And when, when you stay like that and connect with God like that, with that kind of faith, what you're really demonstrating is that you're coming to know God. That you're getting to know her characteristics, her attributes and her qualities. And so what I'm going to do over the coming months is I want to start speaking with you more directly about God's attributes and qualities so that you can begin to get to know better the person you're desiring love from. Right? And, and as you do that and as you recognise a lot of those qualities and attributes and you can experiment even with them, you'll start recognising this beautiful being that's in, unimaginable that you can connect to and experience, personally experience, not, not hear about from somebody else, but personally connect with and experience. And when you get to that point where you're personally experiencing it, from that moment on, you won't even need to come to another session like this because you're going to be out teaching sessions like this. D does that make sense? Why wouldn't you? If you're personally experiencing God's love and you can feel it real and you know how to do it, isn't that the time to, for you to then show others? And what I, what I would like to see and one of my desires is that the 200 or so people that are here right, ha are 200 or so teachers. And I don't see any of you again. And instead, I come along and sit up the back in one of your talks <laughs> and sit back and just feel all that love coming from you 
and feel all that connection with God coming from you and feel that relationship you have that you're willing to share with others. And what, what the world... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I was just about to take off then. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, not only just for one, but for everyone. But what, what the world also needs is teachers. <laughs> you know, it needs people who have learnt enough about love that they can show others how to love. That's what it needs. And we can argue and fight about the semantics. We can argue and fight about you know, whether what I'm saying here is true or what I'm saying there is true, but in the end, it's the love that's going to demonstrate the truth to everyone around us. And you can see people seeing you change. Some of them don't like it and some of them do. But that's the effect of truth too. Truth is like this two-edged sword that cuts between everything. It divides things up. The reason why it divides things up is because it separates the falsehood from the real. And the world needs this. You know, we've lived too long with untruth, haven't we? That's why you are sitting in an audience like this, isn't it? Because you, you've been seeking truth all your life. That's why we're here. So, so allow the world to come to know this truth that you know. Allow yourself to act upon it. Allow yourself to feel it. And then as that grows in you, the motivation grows in you, what will happen is you'll feel such a strong desire to teach others. And you won't want to be sitting in an audience anymore, not because you want popularity or glory or any of those other things, but because you want more truth to get out there and you know that you're a part of it. You know that you have some that you can share to others. And you're not afraid to do that. And it's faith that brings you all these things. So I'm glad we've had the opportunity to talk about the subject of faith with you today. And what we'll do um, in the coming few months, as I've, I've said, is I'd like to talk more with you about some of God's qualities so that, so that we can feel a bit more rapport with God, a bit more of a longing for God and, God and to understand God's nature. And then as we do that, we can continue to grow and change and you'll find that everything, everything that you have been told, you know, many of you in the past have been told by mediums that this is the time of change on the world and this is the, you're going to be personally involved in this time of change on the world and you've gone, I don't know how that's going to happen. Well, now you know how it's going to happen. You're going to be a teacher of truth to the world. Not because you're out there going blah, 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 like I am, but because you, firstly, you're living it. And secondly, then you go blah, 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 because you, t <laughs> you teach it, because you live it. And, and the more people we have living it and the more people we have teaching it, like there are literally hundreds of locations around the earth crying out for people to visit them. They need the teacher. They need the person who knows about love. And that's what we can do. We can be a part of the people who know about love. We can learn about it ourselves, actually feel about it inside of ourselves, change the feelings inside of ourselves to the point where we know it for certain and then we're ready to teach it to others. It's just going to be beautiful, I think. Yeah. Thanks for all of you who are involved in cleaning up after these sessions. I'd like to thank again for you for your donations, not only of um, the, the money that you give us, but but many of you are giving large amounts of your time to the process of delivering truth and we'd really, we really appreciate those things too. And we'd like again say thanks to you guys for the venue that we have the opportunity to use at the moment and, and we're having so much fun using actually. <laughs> and, uh, and also uh, thank uh, those of you who have been a part of Mary's workshops as well because everything that you do that changes you changes everything around you as well and it's so powerful so we'd just like to thank you for all of those things yes. <laughs>